Well, for those who are here for the faithful few, uh, we're beginning a new series this week. And our previous series was Making the Way. Our series that we're moving into is Living the Way. So in Making the Way, we saw how Jesus, through his death on the cross and his resurrection, made the way of salvation. In Living the Way, we're going to look at how the apostles live in the way that Jesus had shown them after he returned to the Father of Heaven. So we'll, we'll begin this morning with Jesus going to the disciples in Galilee and restoring Peter to his ministry, a ministry that uh, Jesus had called Peter into, a ministry that Jesus had given to Peter. You know, Jesus called the disciples to a purpose. He had in mind for them what they were going to do even before he called them. And we find at the beginning of uh, the, the book of Acts in chapter 1, verses 7 through 8, that Jesus tells them what this is before he returns to the Father. He says to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority for me to restore the kingdom of Israel. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so here, we get a very concise statement of the purpose that Jesus had called them to, the purpose of being his witnesses. Essentially, what he's telling them is, you won't know the day of my return. You won't know the day that the kingdom is going to come in its fullness when heaven and earth are made one. But you have a job to do. Your lives are to testify to who I am and to what's happening uh, as you follow me. I've given you a ministry that's like mine. And the Father and I are going to send you the Holy Spirit so that you can do it. And this gets right at the heart of what it means to follow Jesus. That through the Holy Spirit, our lives are being changed so that they're more like His. That as we follow Jesus, our lives come to look more and more like His. So that what we do is representative of who God is. And this is also at the heart of what it means to be a church. A community of God's people who are together in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And through the life of the community, through the changing life of the community, a witness is made to who God is and what He does in the world. So as we move to God's Word this morning, together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have called us to be like you. Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us the word. Help us now as we engage your word to understand it. Please work in our hearts and our minds to bring conviction. Help us to change to be more like Jesus. Holy Spirit, we put ourselves in your hands. We pray for your work to be done here this morning, and we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Alright, so today we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and if you've got your Bible, you can open there. If you're using one of the Bibles in the seat pocket, it's page 923. <clears throat> So, as we approach the reading this morning, I wanted to take just a moment to summarize where we are, where we've gotten to over the last six months or so that we have been going through the Gospels in this way, following the events of Jesus' activity with the disciples. So, for close to three and a half years, Jesus proclaimed the good news of God's salvation. He performed miracles, and he called people to follow him. He invested his life in a very deliberate way in 12 men, teaching them God's word, growing their faith, and training them to do his work. Jesus lived with them day in and day out. They developed a very close relationship with one another and with Jesus. 
And Jesus willingly gave his life on the cross, and he was laid in a tomb. And after three days, he was raised from the dead. And on the third day, on that day of his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples in and around Jerusalem. He talked with them, he ate with them, and he also appeared to them in Jerusalem again about a week later. However, before his death, he had told the disciples, I'm going to go on ahead of you into Galilee, and so meet me there. Now, Peter and some of the others have traveled up to Galilee, and this is where we find them as we begin reading in John chapter 21, uh, verse 1. So after this, meaning after Jesus had appeared to the disciples that second time in Jerusalem. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, who is called Twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of Jesus' disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore. However, the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. Men, Jesus called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the other side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did. And they were unable to haul it in because the number of fish they caught was so large. Therefore the disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer garment around him, for he was stripped, and plunged into the sea. But since they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in with the boat, dragging the net full of fish behind them. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter got up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, Jesus told him. Jesus asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he'd been asked the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Peter, I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. Mm. He said this to signify by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. Mm. After saying this, he told him, follow me. So Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved following them. That disciple was the one who had leaned against the back of Jesus at the supper and asked, Lord, Who's the one that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, If I want him to remain until I come, what's that to you? As for you, follow me. So this report spread to the brothers that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus didn't tell him that he wouldn't die. But he only said, If I want him to remain until I come, What's that to you? All right. 
So what's happened here? You know, what's what's going on in this sequence of events, this dialogue uh, between Jesus and Peter? You know, really, what's it all about? Well, let's kind of walk back through it and see what's happening here and really what's the main point that Jesus is getting at. You know, it's about a week or so after Jesus' resurrection where we find seven disciples have traveled up to Galilee. And they've gone to meet Jesus there. It's Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James and John, who are the sons of Zebedee, and two others. Right, so we've got seven of the disciples who've gone up to Galilee. We don't know how long they've been there waiting around, but Peter suggests they go fishing. In fact, he says, I'm going to go fishing. Right? And the other guys say, well, we'll come with you. Now, this is not recreational fishing to pass the time. Most of these guys were commercial fishermen. And they're back in the place where they used to earn their livelihoods. They're in their hometown on the water that they used to fish for money. So they're pretty much going back to their trade. They work hard all night long. They don't catch anything. And then some guy on the shore yells out to them. They can hear him because they're not too far out, only about 100 yards. And he says, you haven't caught anything, have you? Try dropping your nets on the other side of the boat. So they do this, and the haul of fish is huge. It's so big they can't pull it up into the boat. And then John notices something, and he tells Peter, hey, look. That guy on the shore, that guy who said, drop your nets on the other side, that's Jesus. And you know, that should be no surprise at this point. Because everything that's happened to them is pretty much like deja vu. They went through all of this before. About two and a half years ago, Jesus found them fishing on the Sea of Galilee. They'd worked hard all night long and they hadn't caught anything. And he got in Peter's boat and he said, put out into some deeper water and I'll show you where to drop your nets. And they had such a huge haul of fish that the boats began to sink, trying to get the fish up in the boats. And you know, at that time, Peter looked to Jesus and said, away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And that may seem like kind of a strange thing to say in this situation, but it wasn't the first time that Peter had met Jesus. Peter and the other guys who were out there fishing that two and a half years ago, along with today in this story that we've just read, they met Jesus for the first time at the Jordan River when John the Baptist had baptized him. And at that time, John said, look, he's the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. He's the one who I've been saying would come, as the scriptures said would come. And he's the guy you should be following. And so they did. They started following Jesus then. But at some point along the way, they went back to fishing. And that's when Jesus had shown up two years ago or so. And this whole sequence of events happened then as well. You know, when Jesus came to call them back at that time, they were ashamed. Peter, in particular, felt his own sinfulness. Here he is, face to face with a man for whom the power of God is clearly working. A man who he was following, who he left. And now, that guy is standing in his boat. And it's undeniable God is at work here. And so Peter's realizing, I've turned away to do my own thing, but God has pursued me. You see, Jesus hadn't turned away from Peter. Instead, Jesus said, look, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So those guys dropped everything and they followed Jesus. But now here they are, again, right? Not just responding to a man who appears to operate in God's power, but 
here's the guy they've been following for two and a half years who they have clearly seen is the Christ, who they know is God. They've seen him walk on water. They've seen him walk out of his own grave. But they're back to their old ways. This time, though, Peter doesn't turn away. He doesn't drop to his knees and say, Lord, I'm a sinful man. But he jumps out of the boat and he swims to Jesus and meets him on the shore. They eat together. Jesus talks with them. And Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Three times Peter responds, yes, you know I do. And three times Jesus tells Peter, then do what I called you to do. If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, take care of my flock. And this gets right to the main point of what's going on here, which is this. Just like God had a purpose for Peter's life, a very specific purpose for Peter's life, God has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for you. Jesus called Peter to follow him for a reason. God has a purpose for Peter's life, and Jesus is calling Peter and the other disciples back to that purpose. And you know, it's not different for any of us. God is the maker and the giver of life, and every life is created for a reason, for a purpose. The Bible says that God has formed each of us in our mother's wombs. He's made every person unique. He's given every person a special gift. No life is an accident. Before the creation of the world, God has known every human life he would make and everything about every individual person. He also knows what that special purpose is that he has for your life and who you will be in his son Jesus Christ, even though you may not know that yet. In fact, none of us know that yet. You know, the Bible says that all believers are ministers and missionaries. Do you know that? Uh, in one of Peter's letters, he says that believers are a holy priesthood. Paul says in one of his letters that by our faith in Jesus, we have been given his ministry and that the Holy Spirit has been placed in us in order to do that ministry. All believers have been given the Holy Spirit. All believers have been given the ministry of Jesus Christ. All believers have been sent out to do this ministry, and that makes them missionaries. Whether you're here, where you live, or you need to go to the other side of the world or somewhere else, you're a missionary. It doesn't matter where you go, it matters that you have a mission. And that's a mission that God has given you. And this is the case for Peter and the other disciples. Jesus chose them for his ministry, and he's come to call them back to it. So let's take a look at how he's doing that, and what exactly it is that Jesus is telling them, especially as he talks to Peter. And we'll begin with that first question, which is this. What is Jesus doing? What exactly is he doing? Well, Jesus is coming back to his wandering sheep. He's coming back to his wandering sheep in order to return them to the fold. The disciples are up in Galilee because Jesus said he'd meet them there. But for some reason, they seem to have wandered away from that purpose. Maybe they've wandered away from the understanding that it was imminent, that he's going to be coming soon. We don't know how long they were there, but at some point it looks like they became restless, right? And Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. And the other guys say, we'll come along with you. It's not like we're doing anything else. So they basically go back to their old way of life. So Peter and some of the guys are out there on the boats, and Jesus shows up. And what happens that day, as we went through, is almost identical to what happened some two, some two, two and a half years ago, when Jesus had first called them, right? And in almost the same sequence of events, Jesus reminds them why they dropped their nets to begin with. 
And this helped them to realize how they'd gotten off track and what they needed to come back to. And you know, we might ask, but why? Why do you do this? I mean, they know now more clearly than ever that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, right? They've seen him come back from the dead. He's appeared to them at least twice as a group before this and some other times individually, right? It's not like it's been all that long since they saw him in Jerusalem. Why in the world would they get restless? Why would they get tired of waiting around and why would they wander from him now? I mean, that just doesn't seem right. But you know, the reality is this. Wandering is a human problem. It is. We get easily distracted, we get easily bored, and we get easily discouraged. People have a hard time waiting. Have you ever known this to be true in your own life? We normally want to take things into our own hands when we feel like God isn't moving fast enough. Or we wonder if he's even paying attention to what's going on because nothing seems to be happening. At least not the things we want. And so we wander. We wander into our own pursuits. We try to do it ourselves. Or sometimes we wander into nothing at all. We just waste our time. We get distracted with nothing. Sometimes we stray because we mess up. And we have a hard time believing that God can still love us. That he still wants us. Or that he can keep using us after what we've done. Especially if it was bad enough. Has anybody here ever felt like that? How can God use me now after what I've done? I mean, I'm completely worthless. He must not love me. He must not care about me. There's no way. I mean, I, I get that maybe I was forgiven before I accepted him, but then I've done some stuff, and I just, I don't know. Does his forgiveness still work now? Some of these things, you know, could have been what was going on for Peter and the other disciples. Every one of them had abandoned Jesus when he was arrested. Not a single one of them except John was there when he was being crucified. And Peter, the night of his trial, the night of Jesus' trial, denied knowing him three times. And the last time he did it, he called down curses on himself. Only to realize that as he was doing that, Jesus was looking him in the face. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt at that moment? How hard it must be for him to look Jesus in the face now? Am I really forgiven? Can he really still love me after that? Can I even love myself after what I did to him? You know, God says in his word, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I have chosen you and called you by name. I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. We could add to that in whatever you do. Jesus does love Peter. Peter is forgiven. And Jesus is helping him to realize that. You know, the question isn't, will God forgive him? The question is, will Peter forgive himself? So let's have a look at their conversation again in verses 15 through 19. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? In other words, do you love me more than these other guys here? Do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than your boat and your nets? Do you love me more than anything in the world? Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Well, feed my lambs, Jesus told him. A second time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. A third time, Jesus asked him, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time Peter was grieved that he'd been asked the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. And Jesus said this to signify to him the kind of death that would bring glory to God. And after saying this, he told Peter, follow me. Follow me. What is Jesus telling Peter here? Let's ask that question. What is Jesus telling Peter? Well, two things. Number one, you're forgiven. Number two, you've got a job to do. And if you love me, guess what? You'll do it. Over and over again, Jesus has told the disciples, those who love me keep my commands. Those who love me do what I tell them to do. If you love me, you'll show it, and you'll show it by trusting me. You'll show it by doing what I tell you to do because you'll understand that it's good. It's better than anything else you could have come up with for yourself. Jesus asks over and over again, do you love me? Not because Jesus doubts it. He doesn't doubt that Peter loves him. It's not that Jesus doesn't know the answer, but Peter needs to say it. And Peter needs to believe it himself. Three times Peter denied Jesus, and three times here, Jesus gives Peter the opportunity to affirm his love. And three is a very significant number in Jewish culture. It's the number of completion, it's the number of reconciliation, and according to Jewish law, when something has been done three times, it's permanent. It's permanent. Three times Peter had denied Jesus. I'm sure he felt like that was permanent. He had just gone too far. But three times, Jesus has Peter affirm his love. Three times, Peter gets to do it and make it permanent. And it hurt. Peter was grieved the third time he was asked. It was almost insulting to be asked a third time. But Jesus knew that Peter needed to be pushed there to really overcome what was troubling his heart and was keeping him stuck. Even though it hurt, he needed to do it. Peter, on some level, must have felt that what he'd done was unforgivable. But Jesus shows him that nothing is beyond God's forgiveness. You know, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. He knows that we're not. What he wants is our repentance. What he wants is our love. What he wants is for us to recognize that we're imperfect, that we can't do it all on our own, and that we need him. And that we will repent, we will change from our way that we're going and turn toward him in love. And because we love him and we trust him, we'll do the things that he says are good. We will obey. He just wants our repentance and our love. He's taking care of everything else. And we show our love by being obedient. We show our love and our trust by following his son Jesus. You know, God has a plan for Peter's life. One that's been in mind even before Peter knew about it. Jesus has been teaching him. He's been training him. And what he has called him to do is to be a shepherd. He's called him to be a pastor. And this is what Jesus reminds Peter of when he says, Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Follow me. Peter, I've called you to be a shepherd. Now act like it. My sheep are going where you go, and they're not going the right way. Do you know why that is? You're not following me. But they're following you. Get back on track, man. It's not just you who's going astray. You're taking everybody else with you. You know, Peter was the head of the group. He was the one who everybody looked to 
and followed after Jesus. And Jesus knew that when he was gone, Peter is going to be the guy who they follow. Jesus knew that Peter was a leader and he developed him in that role. Jesus told the disciples, hey look, when I'm arrested, all of you are going to scatter. The scripture says it. The shepherd will be struck and the flock will scatter. But Peter, I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you that your faith will fail. And when you come back around, go and strengthen your brothers. They're going to be looking at what you do, Peter, and you need to help them. They're going to follow you, so you need to be following me. But here, look what happened. Peter is the one who took the guys fishing. Back to their old lives, and Jesus had to come to him on this. He's the guy who had the bright idea. Man, I'm tired of waiting around. I'm going to go fishing. Okay, we'll come with you. And there they are, out on the sea, right? Not too far offshore. And Jesus comes, and he has to correct Peter. He has to speak the truth to him in love. And boy, it hurt. But Jesus' love comes hand in hand with his forgiveness. And his forgiveness comes hand in hand with his call to follow and just as Jesus asked Peter to affirm his love three times, Jesus told Peter three times to be a shepherd, to follow him. And you know, this gets right at the heart of what Jesus is telling Peter. And what Jesus is telling every single one of us who calls him Lord. And it's this. Living in God's forgiveness means following Jesus. You know, he died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. God's forgiveness is found in Jesus Christ. His call is to follow him. And if we're going to walk in his forgiveness, it means following him. If we're going to live the life that he gives us, the new life that we're born into by accepting him as Savior, it means to follow him. Accepting his forgiveness means to trust him and walk after him. Peter was chosen by Jesus. He was loved and taught by Jesus. Jesus knew Peter was going to stumble. Right? He didn't call Peter to be a perfect person. He called Peter to follow him, to start walking in his way. But he knew full well, Peter, is, you're going to take some missteps. You're going to stumble and you're going to fall down. But, you know, stumbling is part of following, and God knows that. Following Jesus means to accept God's forgiveness and to accept it as you stumble and to keep getting back up and to keep following. It means to accept God's forgiveness and keep moving toward Him. And this is often the hardest thing for many people to do, to continue accepting that God will continue to forgive them. And that God continues to forgive them because Jesus' forgiveness is complete. There's nothing that we can do to earn God's forgiveness. We can't work for our salvation. It's not dependent on anything we do other than believing God. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price in full for all the sins of the world, past, present, and future. Paid the price not only for what you have done, but for what you will do. God knows that you're going to continue struggling with sin. It's just a reality of this life. James says, we all stumble in many ways. Paul says, I know the good that I should do, but I often find myself doing the bad that I know I shouldn't do. And these are by no means excuses for sinning. It's by no means an excuse for stumbling. It's just simply an admission of the fact that none of us is going to be perfect until the day that we see Jesus face to face. Amen. None of us is going to be made perfect until after we die. You know, following Jesus is a journey of being made like him. And being made like him little by little. It doesn't happen all at once. 
It happens progressively. It, it's, it involves coming to an understanding that God has judged all of your sin and forgiven it all in Jesus. And that when he looks at you, immediately he sees you in his son, clothed in his righteousness, washed in his blood, pure and white and without wrinkle or spot or blemish. He sees you as a perfect person because he will make you perfect and that's guaranteed when you accept his salvation. But when you see yourself, when others see you, we're not there yet. As we walk through this world, we're just not there. God knows what's going to happen. He knows who you're going to be because he's going to make you that person. And because he's going to do it, it's as good as done in his eyes. Amen. But we struggle with the fact that it's not a tangible reality in our lives right now. We get troubled when we fall into our old ways and our old patterns, and sometimes we get caught up in that. And we think there must be something wrong. But you know, as you walk through this life, you're walking toward how God sees you. And that journey is going to involve dealing with these things. And it's going to involve the understanding that though God sees you this way, and it will be that way, you just are not there yet. You will stumble, but you can't allow the stumbling to stop you from walking. And this is exactly what Paul reminds believers of when he writes to the Ephesian and the Roman churches. And he says to them, basically saying, you have been chosen in Christ before the creation of the world for adoption into God's family. Even before the world was created, you have been known about and you have been chosen and God has chosen you for adoption into his family. And that through Christ, you are made holy and blameless in God's sight according to the purpose of his perfect will. This is going to happen. It's for sure. However, we are all sinners and all fall short of God's glory. But even in this, God works all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. He knew that he would change you and you would become like Jesus. And he did this by placing you in Christ Jesus to do good works that he's prepared and advances your way of life. And so, those God has predestined, he is called, and those he's called, he's justified, and those he's justified, he will also glorify. What a relief it is that the guy who spoke these words called himself the most wretched sinner of all. Amen. Completely undeserving of God's grace and forgiveness. But rejoiced that God would choose and even use a wretched man like himself. Have you ever felt like that? Gosh, I'm just, there's got to be something wrong with me. You know? There's no way that God's grace or God's forgiveness could really work for me. There's no way that he could really use me. You know, that's a good place to be. Because when you're there, you understand how much you need God. Amen. You understand how much anything that's good happens because of him in you, not because of you yourself doing it. Amen. And that you're completely dependent on him. That's when God uses us the most. And you know, this must have been how Peter felt too. Because this is exactly what Jesus tells Peter when he talks to him. Peter, you're loved. You're chosen. You've stumbled. But don't worry, I haven't forsaken you. I know who I'm making you into. My forgiveness and my love are complete. Just keep following me. Keep living in my way. And as you do... You'll find my love. You'll find my forgiveness. You'll find my life in you. You can trust that I've started a good work in you. And I'm faithful to see that good work through to completion. Peter, when you're old, you won't dress yourself. And you won't go where you want to go. 
You'll stretch out your hands and in your death you'll glorify God. And guess what? He'll also glorify you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you have come into the world. Thank you that you love us enough to give your life for us. And that in giving your life, you also give us a promise that if we follow you, our lives will become like yours. That as we grow, we won't go our own way. We won't be putting on our own belt and dressing ourselves and choosing our own paths. But that you'll be the one doing it. You'll be the one who's clothing us. You'll be the one who's directing us. And though you're going to take us places that we may not want to go, those are good places. And that in the end, you will bring us through death. And in doing so, you'll glorify us. But even in our lives, you'll lead us into death. You'll lead us into laying down things that we have to let go of. We have to stop holding on to. You'll help us to see the path we need to walk. And in this life, we'll bring you glory through doing that. And in our deaths, you'll glorify us. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us now as we take a moment to look at ourselves and see where you're leading us that we don't want to go, but we need to go. Help us to see what we need to lay down that we're holding on to just too tightly. Help us to see how we can glorify you in this life by doing what you called us to do. Holy Spirit, please bring a clear thought into each of our minds about that. Help us to see the clear action that you want each of us to take. We pray this in the name of Jesus.